Bitcoin slump uh, when Iran launched its attack on Israel last week and raising some questions about the idea that investors may see crypto as a safe haven during times of global tension. Join us right now on this, the having and so much more. Anthony Scaramucci, Skybridge Capital founder and managing partner. Uh, please weigh in. We saw you weighing in on, on Twitter over the weekend when I think a lot of folks were trying to figure out what was going on. We've seen a Bitcoin fall over the since that weekend and and effectively stay where it is, uh, despite where equity markets are. It's trying to understand sort of these price movements. Well, I, you know, I wish I could understand the price moves myself. I think where, where I'm coming from is a little bit of longer term as opposed to just the week to week or day to day price movements. I think the point I'm trying to make is that Bitcoin is on an adoption curve. Uh, if you go back to Web One, Bitcoin is sort of in the 1999 point in the spectrum. And so just imagine where we went from Web 1 to where we are today. And so my, my point is you won't see this be a inflation hedge or a store of value, as other pundits are saying, until you get over a billion users. And so right now, it's going to be way more volatile than people like. And people look at it as a risk on or risk off trade until we get to that adoption curve. That's my point. And given so, the adoption curve, what do you see right now as the upside and number and what do you see as the downside number call it 12 months well i mean look you, you could get shocks like wars and you could get you know, you know god forbid a terrorist calamity or something like that that could take bitcoin down 10 or 15 percent but i think you have a heavy bid on bitcoin because of the demand from the etfs and from the eventual drivers of things like the wirehouses that will enter the space as well as the 401k market so so i don't think you have 50% downside, but you could have 10 or 15% downside just because it's still a risk on, risk off asset. But long term, with the halving coming this week, Andrew, right. I think this thing trades to 170, possibly to $200,000. And, and that's consistent with where it's been over the 15 years of Bitcoin. It's so sensitive to the starting point, though, like what you want to say, how this behaves or what does it typically do under different environments. I just looked at a chart yesterday. Since June 30th of last year, Bitcoin has been beat for beat with NVIDIA stock. OK, I mean, nobody's saying it's exactly the same thing, but it sort of moves along this. Hey, we're investing in this big picture future. This seems to be a way yeah. to play it. Um, the other piece of it is if the analogy is 1999 and Web 1.0, what was the central asset that you would have bought in 1999? Bandwidth? That's that's done nothing but gone down in value. Like, what's the thing well, no, you're investing? I, you know, in? if you if you bought, like, okay, let's use Amazon as an example. Okay, right. and I think I think this is the point that Andrew is trying to make: is this risk on or risk off? Well, in 1999, Amazon was an emerging stock on an emerging technology, and it was quite volatile. And you lost 20 to 50 percent eight times in Amazon. You, at one that point, one, you lost 80 percent. Yeah, that one time in March of 2020, it went down 80 percent. But if you held Amazon over that period of time, $10,000 is worth a little over $14 million today. And so, so, and Amazon is now trading consistently with the volatility of the overall S&P 500, and it certainly wasn't also doing that. Also producing cash flow. 25 <laughs> years ago. I use a lot of Amazon. Okay. Okay, I don't but, use a lot of Bitcoin. Is that a problem at some point? And what do you expect to happen when we go through a dot-com bust type moment for the broader market? Does yeah, the well, feeling I, about Bitcoin I think, I think if we go through a dot-com bust in the broader market in the next year or two, I think you'll have a price shock in Bitcoin consistent with a dot-com bust. However, if you're willing to hold that asset, which we are over a rolling four-year period of time, no one has ever lost money in Bitcoin. Uh, but if you're willing to hold the asset for, let's say, five years, John, I think you do very, very well in the asset. It doesn't have cash flow. Gold doesn't have cash flow. Uh, but it does have cash flow in a weird way, because if you treat it like cash, cash can offer you a yield in the bank. And even though we had these problems with things like BlockFi during the crash, you know, you could go to places like Galaxy, which is a in my opinion, a tremendously undervalued asset, probably the most undervalued asset in the crypto space, and you could get yield in a borrowing agreement there. So you do have cash flow on Bitcoin if you think about it that way. And so long term, uh, I predict people will do very well. And I think the, the, the point I was trying to make to Andrew through Twitter and here on the show is that, yeah, sure, it's 14 years old, uh, but it's still very young in terms of the adoption. In terms of adoption vis-a-vis vis -vis the ETF. You look out your, your four-year sort of time horizon. 
what percentage of Bitcoin effectively is owned by BlackRock on behalf of individuals good versus question. individuals owning it themselves? Well, it's a good question. So let's say there's 15 or 20 billion now, just using rough numbers, and the assets got a, a, a trillion four in market capitalization. And let's say it went up 5x from that. Uh, and let's say the market capitalization didn't move. It's still less than 10 percent of the overall ownership of Bitcoin. So uh, this whole notion that the ETFs are going to overly centralize Bitcoin, I don't buy. I think what the ETFs are, though, is they're a great conduit for people that are used to buying Does them. Does the ETF create more price discovery? I mean, in some ways, you think it should create more price discovery, which in some well, it obviously has, though, Andrew. Look, I mean, I think we were... 40, well, but in the initial stages, the discovery will always be about adoption, so it should go up. The question yeah. is, long term, does it create a sort of different sense of discovery? And you also have to think that the initial, the people who own Bitcoin today were always true believers, right? It was just sort of a special cohort of people who sort of thought about Bitcoin in an unusual way. I don't know in the future if you have a large volume of Americans owning it through ETFs. Hopefully, they won't all be true believers in truth. You'd want them to all think different things about it. Well, and I don't know what that I, means. Well, listen, I mean, you, you guys have a, a lot of skepticism on the desk. I think the skepticism is well-founded. I started out as a skeptic. I think what got me past being a skeptic is the notion that this is immutable, it's, a, it's decentralized in a way that makes it very powerful. The network itself is scaling. And if you think about the way we treat money in our society over the last 5,000 years, Bitcoin checks all of the boxes. The only box it doesn't check is central bank manipulation, which I think it makes it way more powerful. And so at a trillion four, could this trade to half the market capitalization of gold, where gold is $16 trillion today? We believe it can. We actually think it's going to go through the market capitalization of gold. And if you're making the point that uh, the American owners right. in an ETF are not going to be enough to get it there, uh, I disagree because over time the acceptance regulatorily is going to allow people to put it in the portfolio. A 1% position yeah. in these global portfolios takes it there.